Good afternoon, everyone. This is Surbhi Mishra, program host for this webinar and conference producer for the ET Legal World, which is a dedicated deep eyed online news portal by the Economic Times. The Economic Times is extremely aggressive in the digital mode and coming up with several virtual activities across the different portals. And today I welcome you all to the another webinar organized by etlegalworld.com. Hope all of you are doing safe and you are doing really well. And I'm really pleased to see all of you in the large numbers. So to begin with etlegalworld.com, I'm really glad to inform you that we are trying to make it one stop destination for all legal professionals to get insights on emerging trends, new frontiers and the latest avenues in the Indian legal scenario. And we are coming up with lots of digital and virtual activities so that we can connect with people, engage them and make some really informative conversation so that we all can learn more through etlegalworld.com. So today's particular topic is employment and labor law challenges faced by the industry in COVID-19. We have chosen this particular topic because we believe that this topic is extremely relevant and crucial in these crisis situation. And for this very tropical discussion, we have very, very important people here who will not only guide you, but also give you a clear and better perspective on the subject. Before we go into the discussion, I would like to request all my dear attendees to drop in their doubts and queries in the box provided. And we'll be taking the questions at the end of the session in our Q&A round. Now I would like to request Mr. Sundar Ramanathan, advocate and co-founder at the Sarvada Legal, who is also a moderator of this panel, to take us forward from here. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Survi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed a great pleasure for me to be here today to moderate the session with two very distinguished panelists, Dr. Sanjeev Gemavat and uh, Mr. Shivel Kumar. Um, I welcome at the outset Dr. Gemavat and Mr. Kumar. Thank you for taking time out and joining us in this uh, very interesting debate and discussion on employment issues in the COVID situation. I would also like to thank all the participants who have taken time out today uh, because we do understand this is really a testing time for all of us and uh, uh, there are a lot of issues at home, pressures that we face, but at the same time, the idea is to stay focused, motivated, and positive. And it is in this light that ET Legal has brought out this seminar, and various other webinar initiatives have been taken by them. We do hope that uh, you do find this webinar interesting and are also able to uh, take a few talking points. And uh, we do hope, as uh, Surbi mentioned, that we, at the end of the webinar, are able to at least clearly point out the various issues and give you points which you think are necessary for an industry and employer to learn in these testing times. Uh, so what we do intend to do today is um, um, we will take you through the background of what are the various measures that have been taken. And I'll also be specifically posing certain questions to Dr. Gemawat and Mr. Kumar. Uh, and then we'll take it forward from there. But before we start, uh, uh, there, there is no need for any introduction for Dr. Gemawat or Mr. Kumar. Uh, I've been hearing the names for uh, um, several years now, and most of us who have been in the legal profession would uh, know that Dr. Gemawat and Mr. Kumar are distinguished legal professionals. Uh, but nevertheless, it is my solemn duty today to give a small introduction, which will uh, let the audience uh, know today the uh, uh, the background of for the distinguished panelists. So with that, let me first quickly uh, give an introduction of Dr. Gemawat and Mr. Kumar, uh, who, as I said, both of whom do not require any introduction, but uh, for the interest of the audience, let me speak a few words about the two panelists today. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gemawat is the executive director, lead and group company secretary for the Dalmia Bharat Group. He is not only a general counsel and a corporate secretary, but he's a thought leader and a strategist with a business orientation. He also is multifaceted and has several degrees. He, in addition to being a lawyer, is also chartered secretary from UK, a chartered accountant and a cost and management accountant. And uh, Dr. Gamath has almost three decades of experience, having worked in different industries across different sectors and uh, has been associated with various organizations. He has received several laurels and has been honored as one of the India's finest in-house councils, the most influential corporate council and company secretary, and has also been inducted to the Global Hall of Fame for contribution and work into the legal system in India and the world, and has also led various committees and delegations 
with different multilateral bodies such as the WIPO, WTO, European Commission, Law Society of England and Wales, and is also presently the co-chairman of the Law and Justice Committee of the PhD Chamber of Commerce. Uh, good afternoon, welcome, Dr. Gemawat. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have our second distinguished panelist, Mr. Srivals Kumar, who is the General Counsel and Senior Vice President Legal for Raheja Universal Private Limited. Uh, Mr. Kumar uh, has an enriching experience of having been an in-house counsel for more than 25 years in reputed companies and brings with him a cross spectrum of experience from different sectors. He has worked in reputed companies like Bharati Airtel, Tata Teleservices, Star TV, Mumbai International, Flipkart.com, and Rastamji Group. Um, he holds an LLB degree from Faculty of Law, Delhi University, after graduating in B Economics from Delhi, and also holds a postgraduate diploma in Business Management from the Bharati Vidyabha, New Delhi. He's also been um, awarded various awards, and um, one of them, notable among them being the Legal Achievers Award in 2019 for Professional Excellence and Distinguished Service in Corporate Sector, which was awarded to him by none other than the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Deepak Mishra. He also has been in various leadership roles since 2010 and has experience in various aspects in the legal profession, such as litigation, contracts, statutory compliance, advisory to business units, as well as regulatory affairs, including policy advocacy in highly regulated sectors, such as telecom, media, airport, and real estate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Srivals Kumar, for joining us and taking time for joining us today. Thanks, uh, with with this background, what we intend to do today is um, at the outset, we will give a broad flavor of what are the various measures that have been taken by the central government and the state government in so far as labor and employment law issues are there, which concern the industry, which have affected the industry, actually. And then we have identified a series of questions, which I intend to pose to Dr. Gemawath and also to Dr. Mr. Kumar, uh, so that we're able to uh, take advantage of their experience and their distinguished legal acumen. And thereafter, once we finish those line of questions, which we hope will answer most of the queries that the participants have today. But in addition, if there are any further queries that the uh, participants do have, you can indicate in the chat box as Surabhi has already informed you. And we'll take up those questions and try to have the distinguished panelists try to answer them. Um, because it's a time-framed seminar, if by chance we are not able to answer any of the queries, of course, you can reach out to Surabhi or any other panelists. We'll be more than happy to help you. Um, I should also add a caveat, as most lawyers do, that uh, this is being given in the interest of spreading knowledge and giving a flavor to the industry. Uh, the two distinguished panelists are panelists associated with distinguished organizations. The views that they're expressing today is only their personal views, so that they're able to give a flavor and a perspective to all the participants and is not associated with the views of their organization. So with this caveat, uh, what we shall do today is first look at the framework or the various measures that have been taken by the governments in this COVID time relating to employment and labor laws. Uh, what we have done is uh, uh, the three panelists today, we had a discussion. We thought we could identify the various measures in four different stages uh, by the government of India. Uh, so stage one, most of us would be aware, is an advisory that was issued by the Ministry of Labor and Employment Government of India on 20th of March. You'll see that at point 1.2, in the screen in front of you, uh, wherein it was an advisory. It was the nomenclature of an advisory. It said, or directed, not even directed, but gave an advice to employers not to terminate or reduce the wages of employees and workmen. We can quickly have a look at Annex Show 1 in Annex Show 1. Yeah, if you can yeah, go down. We can have a look at uh, paragraph number 2 in this document that is there in front of you, which is the circular of 20th of March 2020 issued by the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Uh, the second paragraph reads, in the background of such challenging situation, which is the COVID time, all the employers of public or private establishments are advised to extend their coordination by not terminating their employees, particularly casual or contractual workers, from job or reduce their wages. If any worker has taken leave, he should be deemed to be on duty without any consequential reduction in wages for this period. Further, if the place of employment is to be non-operational due to COVID-19, the employees of such unit will be deemed to be on duty. And if you go to the last sentence in the next paragraph, it says, in view of this, you are requested to circulate this advisory to the employers or owners of all the establishment registered with their association for compliance. So the nomenclature that was issued is more of the nature of an advisory. They had issued it as an advice to um, all organizations and associations saying, 
in the fight against covid please advise your employers or owners not to terminate or reduce wages so that's the first stage that we saw in so far as the measures taken next we have the second stage which is the measures taken up to the stage of the national lockdown which are all aware is on the 24th of march um here again you have two broad categorizations in this uh, uh, stage one again those that were in the nature of advisories uh, which we had already seen that was issued by the ministry of labor we have just given certain examples i don't want to show all documents because they are more or less the same repetition of what we've already seen um, so like there were advisories issued by the haryana government and the government of kasan uh, so the idea is to give a cross spectrum of different measures taken across the breadth length and breadth of the country that's why we're looking at assam and haryana and different states across the country so that was again in the nature of an advisory which we saw but then you had notifications that were issued by different state governments which were uh, more in the language which were mandatory in nature there are three categories that we at least found uh, one is uh, where in fact they were notification issued pursuant to the epidemic diseases act particularly section 2 of the act there in where the notifications were issued by the state governments to all the employers direct to make payment of wages and salaries to the workmen and employee um so we have two examples i'll show you both the notifications one is a notification by the government of andhra pradesh the other is a notification by the government of up we'll first have a look at annexure 4 so if you see the first paragraph underneath the words notification it is issued pursuant to the provisions of the epidemic diseases act and i'll draw your attention immediately to para 2 sub para 3 which says all the governments as well as private establishments shall make payment of wages or salaries fully to the workers or employees including those working under contract and outsourcing basis during the lockdown period any violation will be viewed seriously and invite penal action under the epidemic diseases act so you can see that this is again issued in exercise of section 2 of the epidemic diseases act and para 2 is exactly a similar paragraph in this where the direction is to all employee and workmen of shops commercial establishment factories uh, that they shall uh, provide holiday with wages for all workmen and employees so therefore we see that these two notifications the direction is to both employees and workmen to all establishments so we've seen first there were advisories then these mandatory notifications that are issued under the epidemic diseases act the other is a slightly slight variation where in states like bihar and in madhya pradesh what had happened was pursuant to the epidemic diseases regulation that were issued the states stated that whatever advisories are being issued by the central government under covid they'll be deemed to have been issued as directions under these regulations so therefore we've already seen the 20th march notification circular rather issued by the ministry of labor and employment so though issues whether it is advisory mandatory or directory in nature because of the notification issued by bihar and madhya pradesh even those advisories even if assuming they are not mandatory in nature they may also seem to be mandatory uh, but this again was for therefore all employees not just workers but it was also for all uh, employees uh, if you look at this it says all advisory is issued or to be issued by the government of india on covid will ipso facto be treated as directions under these regulations so this is the effect on this and the third third category so if you can go back to the word document third category were where there were notifications issued which were principally directed at workers like in the case of government of karnataka the language is similar but it was principally to workers so i don't need to show you that but we are trying to give you an overall framework and a flavor of what are the different steps taken uh, then we move to stage 3 which is the national lockdown that has been issued by the central government the ndma issued an order under section 6 we are aware of the disaster management act um pursuant to that guidelines were issued by the national executive committee under section 10 for social distancing all of us are aware that a large number of guidelines and directions that were issued pursuant to that even state governments also issued notifications now there is one issue that comes out over here as to what will be the effect of the notifications that have been issued by the state governments previously under the epidemic diseases act what happened to them do they still continue are they being superseded or um, are these notifications issued under the disaster management act do they completely override the earlier notifications that's also an issue that i'll uh, deliberate and debate with my panels uh, but i'll uh, post it for the time being and i'll move forward uh, the last stage is ultimately the main crux of what most industries and most uh, employers are looking at which is effectively the order on 29th of march all of us are aware that uh, because of the migrant workers problem we all saw it on our phones in the tvs 
a um, lot of migrant workers unfortunately trying to get back to their homes were stranded at bus stops railway stations etc and uh, the government had to take an immediate urgent step to uh, help protect them to contain uh, the pandemic as well so pursuant to that you had the 29th of march order that was issued we are all aware about that but for the purposes of the participants and to understand what exactly were the uh, implications we'll just quickly have a look at the 29th of march uh, notification order rather uh, if you look at the paragraph it starts with whereas it's a third paragraph in this particular order uh, they identify two principal uh, reasons as to why they want to do it uh, to deal with the situation and for effective implementation of the lockdown measures and to mitigate the economic hardship of the migrant workers uh, steps were being taken in pursuance to section 10 to l of the disaster management act and number of steps are taken in terms of uh, ensuring adequate arrangements for food shelter for the poor and needy and for having quarantine facilities but most importantly what we are going to concentrate today is in paragraph roman number 3 which i'll read out for the benefit of everyone uh, it uses the word all employers be it in the industry or in the shops and commercial establishments shall make payment of wages of their workers at their workplaces on the due date without any deduction for the period their establishments are under closure during the work down so when you look at the uh, order they use different terms we'll try to deconstruct these terms for you here today they use the word all employers be it in industry or the shops and commercial establishment payment of wages what is the import of the word wages that is being used here uh, for workers does it mean workers does it include employees it is only have into account blue collar employees and not white collar employees what is implication uh without any deduction that's an important aspect because a lot of em employers are suffering if they have to make payments today what will be the implication without any deduction and the fourth term is for establishments that are under closure during the lockdown so this broadly is the uh, uh the overall legal framework you see that we've seen four stages as i've already enumerated stage 1 the circular stage 2 notifications issued by the uh, different state governments stage 3 is the national lockdown measures in stage 4 we have the march 29th order we also have of course as most of us would be aware um, in this webinar today petitions that have been challenged uh, before the supreme court challenging these um, uh, circulars and these notifications we'll also try to look at and understand what these issues are because so that gives the crux of what is there in the march 29th order based on this uh, background i will now proceed uh, to my panelists dr sanjeev gemawat and to mr shrivals kumar Uh, I'll first go to Dr. Gemawat and ask him to share his views on what he thinks could be the scope of the March 29th order, and then we'll have Mr. Shivals also to add up to what his views are. If he is in consonance with the views taken by Dr. Gemawat, or does he have a different view? That also he'll share with us today. So I'll mute myself and I'll request Dr. Gemawat to at least take over. Good timing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sundar. Thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, good afternoon, friends. Uh, first, I would like to thank Economic Times for inviting me to share my views on this uh, topic, which is very, very contemporary topic, and I think impacting the industry as a whole. Uh, and thank you, Sulbi, for organizing everything. Uh, grateful to you for uh, doing everything. Now, uh, Sundar, you, I think you, you, um, you know. explain almost all issues and the four stages explain everything in terms of how this whole mechanism got evolved and i would be limiting my comments on the 29th march order only and before commenting on this we'll have to just see the genesis of the issue and the genesis is a worldwide crisis the genesis is is a life risking situation now in that backdrop this particular order has been issued by the government now this order has been issued under the disaster management act disaster management act empowers the government to issue directions to issue guidelines to do certain things in certain manner so that you can prevent disaster you can mitigate disaster you can take all appropriate measures whatever are required and this particular piece of legislation is an interesting document of course we can come to that issue also whether that that is constitutionally uh, valid or not that's a separate discussion altogether 
but the principal issue here is a piece of legislation which empowers the central government which empowers the state government which empowers the district administration a three tier structure a three tier structure with a complete top down model whereby the respective bodies will have to follow the directions or guidelines which are issued by the higher authorities now this is that kind of legislation now in this backdrop perhaps the government has chosen the lines as you mentioned in section 102l and that you know that sub clause 3 i think perhaps might be intelligently chosen these words because government perhaps wanted this issue to be given a widest kind of interpretation the language here is all the employees be it in the industry or in the shops and establishment then it says payment of wages of their workers without deduction for the period when closer during lockdown now the interesting thing here is all these concepts are legal concepts employer is a legal concept worker is a legal concept wages is a legal concept but then those have not been defined under the disaster management act these concepts have been defined under various legislations payment of wages act defines this there is the industrial disputes act there is a contract labor regulation act there is a workman compensation act this is uh, industry uh, employment orders act there is a minimum wages act payment of wages act these legislations define these things these very concepts but perhaps government has chosen not to borrow any of the definitions of those particular legislations and perhaps the intent is intent is to give it a widest interpretation don't limit it but at the same time we need to think on two issues one issue is the immediate threat at that point of time when the when this order was issued was the issue of migrant labor and this issue of migrant labor is not a small issue it's not an issue of 4000 people or 40000 people or 4 lakhs people it's a 4 crore over 4 crore people the migrant labor over 4 crore migrant labor now in that backdrop you will have to give the interpretation of widest interpretation definitely so from that perspective if i want to interpret this i would say that perhaps the the widest definition which all these labor legislation provides is the payment of wages act provides the widest definition payment of wages act while defining wages that includes salary as well don't Don't, don't make a distinction between wages and salary so to the extent even in the in the uh, if we define if if we if we refer the concept of employees or workers workmen workmen is defined under various legislation but the widest definition is payment of wages act and the payment of wages act definition has been followed in contract labor regulation act minimum wages act standing orders act so it's a widest definition similarly the employer except the managerial kind of people or the people who are in the supervisory or administrative capacity with a threshold of say 10000 rupees they are excluded otherwise all kinds of labor on kinds of workers whatever the nomenclature is you can give them very fancy designations of manager and senior manager or executive or whatever designation but then so far as their nature of work is as specified is in a normal parlance is a skill and a skilled you know various kinds of temporary casual all kinds of workers are included here and that is what perhaps the intention of the government is and that intention is also linked with the with the, the the framework of the legislation this is a social welfare legislation it's a legislation whereby 
you would be taking measures to prevent and mitigate a situation it's not a permanent feature in your life it's only to the extent that 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 menace is there you will have to follow these uh, mechanism so just to conclude as far as uh, uh, briefly on this to my understanding this would be applicable to all employers this would be applicable to all establishments shops step you know all kinds of establishments undertaking factories uh, you know uh, uh, shops uh, um, uh, whether small big etc but the only qualifier here is that this would only be applicable in situations where lockdown is continuing if there is no lockdown then this concept would not be applicable so this is what my brief view is i am open for any questions on this thank you thank you uh, dr gamal uh, i think you identified certain key points i'll uh, as my role as a moderator is to make uh, dr gamawat and mr kumar spar or each other uh, so i'll briefly identify the points you touch and check with mr kumar if he has the same view or he has a different view point on this aspect i think broadly you've indicated uh, there can be no distinction between uh, wages and salaries to begin with uh, you'll have to take the widest possible interpretation in labor legislation considering the situation that we are faced with at this point of time but possibly the only narrowing of definition you felt was in the terms of the definition of worker so those who are below manager level workers um, so only that probably you said are probably covered within this time but you also indicated that this applies to those establishments that are closed at this point of time um, so i'll pose two questions to mr kumar uh, one of course whether he is in conformity with the view taken by dr gemawat does he think this widest possible interpretation has to be given or there is another view possible because the overall objective of this particular order was to specifically protect migrant workers so does it only try to cover migrant workers or is it got a much more wider application like what dr gemawat is stating that's one second if you can also share a little bit on the views on the legal basis of this particular order under the disaster management act because one issue is whether it is really binding what is the impact if parties don't really comply with this particular order uh if you can share some insights on if there is any ongoing matter of the supreme court has taken a view on these that will probably help the uh, participants understand a little bit more so with that i hand over the uh, panel to you thanks sundar uh good afternoon to all the participants as well as the organizers and sanjeev i think uh, it's a very good opportunity given by the economic times legal world to various people in the legal fraternity and related business fraternities also to understand the concept which you are into which is very contemporary as suggested by sanjeev uh, my first opening argue, uh, point would be that we are in some severe times by the cause of this pandemic definitely it calls for a different introspection in the way we look at things uh, having said that if one has to advise whether myself as being a general counsel of a company or advising friends or other people who come to you as a client i think the most important thing is you have to give a proper legal advice and to that extent keeping our emotional content limited i would believe that the current notifications or the circulars and advisories passed by the various state governments and the central government uh, would maybe fail the test of time in terms of when they are put to judicial scrutiny uh, my primary view comes to the fact that the national the disaster management act for which it comes under 2005 regulation or the act has a very clear object and purpose and if you one looks at various sections which are there in the act one would understand that the scope of this act is limited to the role of the central government to work in coordination with the state government and the district authority so that the disaster related issues are addressed easily so let me take a step forward uh, if you look at the provisions of the act it really says an act to provide for the effective management of disasters and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto and if we directly jump across to section 6 uh, i'm just going through the basic sections because i think that will put the context clearly it provides for the powers and function of the national authority 
here also if you look at the various power it looks at only laying down policy on disaster management approve a national plan lay down guidelines to be followed with the state authorities how we want in an integrated matter they can work for prevention of disasters coordinate the enforcement and implementation of the policies for disaster management recommend provision of funds for the purpose of mitigation i think that's a very important aspect i would like to come back to later and if you look at it going down and to the actual section 10 wherein uh, these mha order of 29th seems to have got the powers to make it it speaks of saying that the national executive committee shall assist the national authority in discharge of its function as the responsibility for implementing various policies and plan and ensure compliance if you go down further in the subsection 2 which provides for various activities it again restricts to coordination preparing a national plan monitoring it to some extent in various aspects evaluating and so forth so forth nowhere across i came across a power in the national authority anywhere to look at anything big enough to give them and power to levy something across and especially i will say make a small difference to private uh, or i will say uh, employers or organizations going further two other sections are very important section 37 sub clause 2 37 if you look at it looks at the provision of what the state government can do or a central government can do and it provides very clearly one important word which i didn't find in any of the previous sections which i referred to is section 37 gives them a very very broad scope to use the word every ministry and department shall prepare a disaster management plan which says many things and when it comes to sub clause 2 says very clearly make while preparing disaster management plan under clause a etc provision to finance in the activity specified therein so i believe and if i look it forward down the line the most important is section 46 of this act which mandates to the central government and to this authority the most important thing of creating something called a national disaster response fund uh, there is a history attached to it and uh, this aspect and in section thereafter in section 48 there is a requirement for the states to establish their similar funds so when are we looking at this financial aspect i think this act doesn't anywhere give authority to pass on the responsibility to a private entrepreneur private organization or a sole proprietor running a small law firm or a ca firm or a small shop i think one needs to look at this clearly so my so uh, while keeping our emotional quotient separate in terms of this is the event of disaster we should extend our hand of support to people definitely yes but at the same time this uh, entire act nowhere makes me provide and since i want to make it clear that the mha order only relies on this uh, disaster management act and it does not go to look at any of the epidemic act in the references my view would be that uh, legally speaking there is much to be put to legal scrutiny when the matter actually comes up for final hearing we only at a very interim stage a notice is issued a parties will come they respond and there will be very friendly responses happening so i doubt if there is going to be a stay or it could be stuck down so soon but as it goes for a scrutiny under various specific articles of the constitution whether article 14 19 1g 265 or 300a i definitely feel there is going to be a big scope of legal scrutiny and the bias of this act will be challenged uh, to a greater extent uh, just also want to share one important thing the requirement of creation of a national disaster fund came up for hearing before the supreme court in the matter of swaraj abhiyan in 2016 and most importantly uh, justice ramana who is also part of the current three months bench was the person or the judge who was signatory to the final order along with the chief justice there there was a specific direction to the central government to look at that even after lapse of 11 years nothing has happened kindly take action in three months and i don't seem that seems to happen to that extent we would like that to happen so having said all this legal aspect i will definitely feel that there is much to be looked into the legal aspect and the entrepreneurs and individuals can take defense at certain levels in terms of looking at the legal provisions and as we go to the next sections i will articulate it in more detail thanks thank you mr kumar i think uh, you have uh, 
done a very thorough analysis on uh, the various provisions under the disaster management act clearly identifying the powers that there be with uh, the national authorities is also the state disaster management authorities in terms of section 610 is also section 372 and you also drawn reference to section 46 where there is a clear obligation to have a national disaster uh, fund uh, so in this in light of this your principal point seems to be that there is Uh, no specific power that has been entrusted upon uh, the authority, specifically the national executive authority, or national executive committee, who has issued this uh, in terms of section 10, subsection 2, uh, to give a direction to all private employees. I understand we'll also specifically deal with the issue on whether there is going to be a challenge and what are going to be the grounds of challenge. But I'll now take it on to Dr. Gemawat to understand uh, what he thinks, uh, uh, at least in so far as section 10. is concerned section 10 and section 6 clearly have uh, i believe very wide powers with uh, the national authority as also the national executive committee uh, because there seems to be a view that in times of epidemics such as this in times of disaster there has to be a wide interpretation that has to be given to these kind of statutes and um, it is really an emergency of proportions that we have never seen before in our lifetime at least and let's hope it doesn't happen at least for the next uh for several years to come of several generations and several centuries but in light of this do you uh, seem to be in agreement with the view of mr kumar that there is no specific power or do you feel that even in the absence of a specific power the provisions are generally worded which gives them uh, the central government or the state government the authority to look at all kinds of disaster so the disaster could be in different fronts and it is some kind of a policy measure that they had to undertake at this point of time and as a policy measure they seem to see this is the best way to look at uh, actions uh, or to control the effect of uh, uh, migrant workers moving on so with this i'll pose this question uh interesting question sundar i think uh, shivals has explained it very nicely but then with due respect i differ with his views um he has also touched upon the constitutional aspects of uh, this issue as well but then you use a i think right word emergency situation it's an emergency kind of situation so let us see let us see whether the constitution of india provides a mechanism for this whether this particular legislation is within the purview of constitution of india or not so we all know that this is an emergency kind of situation this is an emergency where the lives of people are at stake not only the livelihood the lives are at stake in a situation like this what is the constitutional mechanism today available to us one can very well argue that whether emergency can be imposed say article 352 but then this is not the same situation as we used to have earlier today after the 44th amendment in the constitution article 352 can only be invoked in the case of war or external aggression or armed rebellion but then before the 44th amendment even article 352 could have been invoked because earlier there was a concept of internal disturbance so today is it a inter, is it an internal disturbance or not your answer would be if it is not an internal dis, uh, disturbance then what what is the internal disturbance all about it's a threat to people threat to the livelihood threat to the lives of people if it is not an internal disturbance then what is the internal disturbance but then you cannot invoke article 352 interestingly in the constitution of india nowhere the term disaster has been mentioned but what the constitution provides is and there is a provisions available in the constitution article 355 says that there is a duty of union duty of the center to protect states against internal disturbance so the word internal disturbance is 
though not there in Article 352, which was earlier the case. But then Article 355 provides that mechanism of internal disturbance that there is a duty of the union to protect states against internal disturbance. Then there are Article 256 and Article 257. Article 256 says that center can give directions to states. Article 257 says states cannot take any action which would prejudice the actions of the union. So if you read these articles, Article 355, Article 256, and Article 257, you will come to the conclusion that constitutionally center has all the powers to issue directions particularly in a situation like this which is provided under the constitution that this is an internal disturbance i fail to understand here when the red petitions gets filed they are linking it with the tax statute it's not a tax statute you can't refer Article 300 for that, that purpose. These are, these are not that kind, this is not that kind of legislation. It's a social welfare legislation. It's a social legislation. It needs to be understood in that context. Well, Article 355, 256, and 257 provides you this mechanism. But then interestingly, Since that disaster and that disaster management related entries are not there in all the three lists, the union list, the state list, and the concurrent list, where would you go? Then Article 250, 248 would get triggered. Article 248 provides all residuary powers with the center. Article 248 provides a mechanism that center can legislate on any issue. So those powers are already there. Now, in this backdrop, in this backdrop, you need to evaluate the Disaster Management Act. When the Disaster Management Act was enacted, this was enacted under the concurrent list entry 23. Now, entry 23 of the concurrent list provides what? That provides social security. That provides employment and unemployment related legislations. So if somebody says that this is not within the purview of the Constitution of India, I fail to understand. I would say that no, this is completely within the framework of the Constitution because this has been enacted under the concurrent list, which is social security, which talks about employment and unemployment. This goes under Article 248, the residuary powers of the state. There's a legislative background in terms of internal disturbance. Article 355 is there, and Article 256 is there, and Article 257 is there. Now, in this backdrop, if you analyze the Disaster Management Act, you will come to a conclusion that union has kept all powers and those are very wide powers let's not limit ourselves in terms of a particular section of uh, uh, the, uh, the disaster management of uh, act of section 6 subsection 2 or uh, i or section 10 subsection 2 l there are wide powers given in the list but then right now since we are talking about the employee issues wages issues etc let's limit ourselves to the to, to section 10 subsection 2 l now this section empowers the government to issue directions for the effective implementation measures to mitigate the economic hardship now in this construct if the if the directions are given i would say that these directions are perfectly valid within the framework of the constitution and let's not forget the fact that there are checks and balances even under this under the disaster management act and let's accept this reality 
that this act also empowers the state, not only state, even the district administration. They can initiate uh, uh, action. They can issue directions. Yes, those directions. If whatever district administration issues directions, that should not be contrary to the directions issued by the state. Or the state gives directions that should not be contrary to the directions given by the union. So union's directions would be paramount. Everybody would have to follow those directions and those guidelines. But then they are free to, 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 to issue directions or, or guidelines on their own as well. Coming to the Epidemic Diseases Act, of course, certain guidelines and certain directions have been passed. You did mention in terms of, uh, you know, uh, even for the salary part, etc. I fail to understand. Of course, there I have a, a differing view because Epidemic Diseases Act does not empower you to give those kind of directions. But then directions under the Disaster Management Act are very, very wide. Within the framework of the Constitution, I would also like to highlight here that as far as the Epidemic Diseases Act is concerned, that has not been tested subsequently because it's an old legislation before the before, uh, before the um, Constitution of India. It's 18, uh, you know, whatever, 1897 um, uh, or whatever. So it's an old legislation before we became independent. So that has not been tested in those very, you know, uh, lights. But then Disaster Management Act is a perfect piece of legislation which empowers the center to take all action, whatever are required to take care of the internal disturbance in the country and also the disaster kind of situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gemawat. I think uh, you've given a, a very good exposition on um, uh, how you feel the provisions of the Disaster Management Act have to be construed. They shouldn't be construed in isolation, but have to be read in light of the powers that are provided for the government in terms of the Constitution, specifically the provisions relating to emergency. Um, internal disturbance was specifically provided. And um, in addition, you also have uh, the residuary powers that are available with the Union under Article 248 with Entry 97 and List 1, which give wide powers. So the... Uh, uh, Provisions under the Disaster Management Act have to be seen in a holistic context, not just in light of uh, the mere provisions alone. Considering the pandemic we are faced in, uh, the union has um, uh, an obligation to provide social security to everyone at this point of time. So therefore, you be, believe that there is a possibility for uh, the state to actually issue directions such as these. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I think we'll dwell a little bit more on the constitutional issues a little later because that's probably... Uh, an area which uh, requires a lot of deliberation. But before that, I thought we could probably move to certain specific issues which may be there in the minds of the participants. We could probably answer those questions and then again move back to the constitutional issues. But before I do that, I'll just quickly summarize what we've done. We've understood the scope of the order of 29th March 2020. We've also seen an overview of the Disaster Management Act, which was given by Mr. Kumar on the various provisions, what he feels is uh, the scope and the powers that are available with the authorities. And then Dr. Gemawat has also given an exposition on uh, the various provisions that are otherwise there as policy powers and other constituent powers that the uh, other powers arising or emanating from the constitution which the union has. Uh, but um, Dr. Gemawat also touched on one particular issue uh, that is pertaining to the Epidemic Diseases Act. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar, I'll just be with you in a minute. I'll just pose this question to you so that you can answer this question. So under the Epidemic Diseases Act, I think specifically in terms of Section 2, uh, the wordings of the provision is the state government under two may take such measures as it deems necessary to prevent the outbreak of such disease or the spread thereof. This is the contour that is provided in terms of section two. Um, Dr. Gemawat, during the course of his um, um, uh, submissions, had stated that probably under the Epidemic Diseases Act, we'd seen various notifications that were issued, which had also created binding obligations to make payment of salaries to employees also under the Epidemic Disease Act. He cursely mentioned that it may not possibly uh, uh, fall or test the scrutiny under the Act itself. So I want to pose one question to you. One is whether you feel uh, the same way, that whether you feel under the Epidemic Disease Act, also there is a provision for directing the private establishment to make payment of salaries and wages. That is one. Second, also assuming uh, at this point of time, if there is no challenge to the 29th March order, what are the repercussions or consequences one were to face under the Disaster Management Act? Is there any penal uh, consequence or what will be the consequence? So we can answer these two questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sundar. So I believe uh, what Sanjeev said had a lot of meat to the argument. 
but uh, i need to bring the attention of uh, everybody on the on this uh, panel discussion including the participants to various provision of the disaster management act and the most important one of that first i want to show this would be section 72 which gives something like an overriding effect so it speaks that act to have overriding effect and i'm quoting the provision of this act shall have effect notwithstanding anything inconsistent therewith contained in any other law for the time being in force or in any instrument having effect by virtue of any law other than this act so we are speaking currently about the disaster management act and herein there is section 72 which has been built in to give it an overriding effect or overriding effect over any other law in force so the most important thing to learn is notwithstanding anything inconsistent so one has to look at it that section 72 gives overriding effect only if there is an inconsistency between any other law and the law out here. So one to look at this first needs to look at it is a sense that whether under the scheme of this act, would it be possible under for the national authority under the disaster management act to have powers under which it could make so the powers of an authority comes under the statute and subordinate legislation will not give a powers to entities uh, told in up team judgments both of high courts and supreme court whenever a constitution challenge is made so one takes us to section 6 sub clause 2 which clearly provides what is the scope of which the national authority is nowhere it provides for it to enter the domain of private world and to entrepreneurs or organizations and say that they have to take the financial obligations in the scenario. I'm keeping the emotional quotient and the moral obligation away for the time being. But if you look at it, uh, my view of this act would be this act was created so that there is very clear guidance given and they are all moving in the same path. There is a direction coming from the national level from the authority which is at the central level, there is state level, there is district level. So there is a coordinated approach. All the entities are working together. And if you look at it, the National Disaster Authority has over the period of time come out with some 30 regulations or advisories how to act in various needs of floods, forest fire, etc., etc. I will not go into that. But the most important aspect, if you go at section six, it's oh, sorry, subsection six of clause, sub clause two of section six, it speaks of recommend provision of funds for the purpose of mitigation one is this and thereafter we go to actual authority under section 10 the powers and functions what they can do here also they don't have anything to go beyond the stuff of asking any other apart from the government to make payment and i was like to say that during this one of the steps that was taken by the labor department ministry of labor in accordance with the ministry of housing is that there is an act called the building construction workers cess which is a percentage collected from all the developers when they construct a building that goes into a fund the implementation of this act was going in a very bad manner last year in a supreme court matter directions were passed for all builders and developers to ensure that they do registration of their workers deposit the money so that in the event of any calamity they can be given benefit of and there is a press release issued by the ministry of labor whereby directions were given that the funds available in such building workers construction cess collected funds should be used for the mitigation of the labors who are on all the places so that's the first aspect the second aspect is one has to look whether and provision is giving a power i appreciate very clearly that this is a very very exceptional circumstances where things have happened so badly that things have to come but to put a law or a direction to mandate certain would be treated differently than what is given as an advisory that please coordinate or it could have been a different sense where that okay please adjust accommodate it is in sense of a dictate to say that you do the needful so if you look at the provisions of these act under the national uh, the, the disaster management act i don't see any powers coming and if i take a step backwards to the epidemic disease act which is the act of 1897 which also had its genesis in terms of some disasters and epidemic happened in that period. The scope or the purpose of the act says an act to provide for the better prevention of the spread of dangerous epidemic diseases. And if one goes to the act, 
it just runs into two pages it only provides for power to take special measures prescribe regulations and thereafter it goes for a penalty and powers of the central government so i think at that juncture it was more to do how to prevent the epidemic to move out so if you look at 2a the powers of the central government it speaks of it may take steps to prevent the outbreak of the disease or spread thereof it may take steps and regulations for the inspection of any ship or vessel leaving or arriving at the port or for detention of people therein so the scope of that act was very limited i will say and i think i will believe that the larger domain came under the national uh, this disaster management act but uh, to take shelter against these second act i would believe is even more uh, i will say open to a legal challenge scrutiny compared to the disaster management act so having put this perspective in place i believe that uh, the more question that will come across to all of us is in this times when very of the i will say uh, first of all i did also want to say at this time that there are different types of employers in the private domain so one needs to take care of them in a different canvas you can't paint everybody in the same canvas so i take an example there could be a very very big financial uh, i will say a corporate like the infosys you have the flipkart amazons you have star tv you have big finances or you take company like hindu sun lever so i think they have the backbone and the financial capability to deal with situation then you will have entities like the tatas mahindra and godrej who thinks is their moral obligation and even at certain pains they will keep on supporting them either through the direct company or through the group companies i think the bigger picture which we have to see in terms of the implication of this act is on a larger belt of uh, employers who i would say in two categories one who were already facing an economic downturn in terms of sectors that are not doing quite well maybe the real estate industry the construction industry the infra the auto meal sales i think everything were having the effect of recessions you already had lot of people uh, terminating laying off reducing salaries of his workers so you are already in a stress position and they were all either about to go to a financially delinquent stage or they were lying at a cliff and maybe backing few matters under the insolvency and bankruptcy court beyond this is an even more worse class i will say are smaller uh, employers who are like a proprietor shop or a, a cas the lawyers the small time professionals the small and msc players i think these usually are the players who make payment of salaries to their next uh, i will say to the to their staff based on the revenues reached from the preceding months one or two months they don't have wherewithals to support them on a long ongoing basis so one has to look at it when this mha order came and subsequently there to the various labor authorities across the state started to look at implementing them i think they never looked at the implementation aspect and whether it would be a mere dictate without being actually helping would have a very i would say disastrous consequences so i think a bit of hindsight certain things need to be looked in a different perspective and looked at how this would have been done and i think in the long run i think time has come wherein we have to look at this issue of a similar nature coming unforbid in some future time how do we address it by creating a fund which could ideally have been come from either the consolidated funds like the government or in the national uh, refund that has been created for this specifically would that have been some amount of money passed on to the employers at later stage or adjustment against their tax requirement or any other payment of other levies that they will get benefit to set that off i think something should have been thought through much more comprehensively than to dictate that you do that and without an end period if you look at it this said continue to make the payment without any putting it related to the lockdown measures so i think somewhere down the line i think there is a time not only for the government but also the employers in the private domain to wake up at the at the various industry levels association level to come up and rethink whether we need to look at it in a different perspective thanks thank you mr kumar i think you've touched on a wide range of points uh beginning with section 72 which provides for the overriding effect of the disaster management act 
but then you correctly point out that there seems to be no provision in the act to direct payment of wages therefore there seems to be no conflict which is a point you're again uh, trying to make out you also made a reference to um, uh, the building construction workers says and the direction given by the government to make use of this for assisting the building construction workers which could also be utilized in other cases as well uh, but one point where i believe you are in conformity with dr gema both the both of you have been sparring in providing different perspectives is on the epidemic diseases act where i think both of you firmly are of the opinion that um, uh, the notifications that have been issued directing payment of salaries of all employees seems to be more than what is provided for in terms of the scope of the enactment so there is a definite ground of challenge we see under that aspect uh, you also touched on a very interesting point uh, on um, uh, treating unequals equally we will probably delve a little bit more in the article 14 challenge when we look at it but the broad uh, contours for your uh, submission was you have different kinds of employers today from a shopkeeper to the biggest uh, organizations in the country and multinational organizations and whether it is fair to uh, paint everyone with the same brush um and he also pointed out whether um uh, uh, with the funds we have from the consolidated fund whether it could have been used to assist these employers in these uh, small micro small medium enterprises in these times whether uh, an issue of proportionality also would probably come in yes mr kumar do you want to add something i think also i i forgot to add a point that uh, i happened to hear uh, mr hari salve senior advocate addressing uh, in a small panel or where he said that at this time one should not look at lack of funds the government has two options one it could have printed money and put in the circulation because there is already so much of uh, uh, shortcomings coming from the collapse of the nbfcs and the various banks so definitely there is a challenge for money in the system and this is the best time number one to do that and second to also look at some provision whereby uh, the government should have been providing doles to the unemployed like it has been happening in various european countries where they have thought a bit more that's to point to add on that thank you thank you mr kumar um, once again for your uh, insightful views on what's happening in other jurisdictions um uh, one other aspect i thought i could uh, take it back to dr gemavit we're going of course back and forth but the idea is to look at issues on how we can specifically address and point to those issues is um, uh, the present lockdown and the direction to make payment of wages or salaries by state governments is in a situation where most of the establishments are closed down where an establishment is not in a position to give work so normally you would face that under the industrial disputes act wherein industry is in a lock is in a position to lay off employees when uh, uh, industries that are covered under the industrial disputes act if for whatever reasons even including cases such as national calamity they may be in a position not to provide work so when such kind of a case is also covered under the industrial disputes act wherein the industrial disputes act stipulates national calamity also could be a reason for not uh, paying the workers or not completely paying the workers you may not give them work but give reduced payment of 50% of the wages uh, you have that on one spectrum and then you have the disaster management act on the other spectrum which gives wide uh, all encompassing powers uh, the question is um, which of these two are more specific in nature you have industrial dispute act specifically dealing with uh, uh, industrial disputes and labor related issues etc and specifically provides for layoff in the case of national calamity on the other hand you have disaster management act which provides however for provisions such as section 72 which provides for an overriding power uh, so in the case of a conflict such as this what do you think should be the right approach that should be taken should you go with the approach under the industrial disputes act uh when the, the action taken by the government seems to be in conflict with that the provisions on the initial dispute act which provides only payment of 50% of the wages in the case of a layoff including actual calamity or do you feel you have provisions under the disaster management act which are all encompassing very general powers to cover any kind of a disaster do you think and in light of section 72 as mr kumar said it's an overriding power do you think that should prevail what would you think should be the right standard to be applied great uh, sundar good question i think shivel has um, you know deliberated on multiple issues i would have just a few comment on that as well but then just to answer your question i don't think that there is any conflict there is no conflict whatsoever under the industrial disputes act and the disaster management act 
Disaster Management Act is a special legislation for special circumstances. It's not for a normal circumstances. It's for abnormal circumstances. We can certainly deliberate whether the quality of those directions were right or wrong, whether they are enforceable or not. That is a separate discussion altogether. But those directions have been issued under that legislative framework, which is right under the constitutional framework and all directions, they are, they are perfectly fine. When I say that there is no conflict between the Industrial Disputes Act and this legislation for the simple reason that this particular piece of legislation and directions issued under this legislation, they would only and only be triggered when there is a lockdown because of COVID-19 situation and lockdown under the government order. So it's a special circumstances, abnormal circumstances. So for example, if suppose there is a unit in Delhi and there is a complete lockdown, then obviously you will have to follow this particular direction. And as Steven rightly pointed out, that's under Section 72, it would have an overriding effect. There is no, no, uh, uh, you know, no, no dispute about it. But then in a circumstances where, where you can operate, where there is no lockdown, or even, even the directions have been issued. And, and if I give the examples of say essential commodities or the industries which are, have been allowed to work. Now in those situations, if suppose somebody doesn't come, somebody refuses to work under one pretext or the other and under the excuse of COVID-19, while there is no lockdown kind of situation there, then you have all the rights to exercise the powers under the Industrial Disputes Act. Please note, Sundar, nowhere in these directions which were issued under the Disaster Management Act, the industrial laws or the, industri uh, the, 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 the Industrial Disputes Act has been suspended. It's not suspended. They are still valid. They are relevant. But then those are in a normal situation and circumstances. So uh, that is exactly the reason why I say that there is no conflict between these two legislations. Yes, if there's a lockdown kind of situation, it's a, it, it needs to be demonstrated at times, perhaps on a case to case basis. If suppose a person is not in a position to come to the plant for X, Y, Z reasons, and they are connected with COVID-19 situation, you cannot exercise uh, um, powers under the Industrial Disputes Act. Then, because it's a general, generic direction which have been issued under the Disaster Management Act that needs to be followed. But then in a situation where, where situation is not of that nature, there's no lockdown then you can certainly exercise the industrial disputes act powers and there, there is no uh, conflict, uh, so to say. So this is what uh, briefly I wanted to mention as far as the conflict part is concerned. Overriding effect, of course, there is an overriding effect uh, as far as, and, and rightly so, because unless you have that overriding effect, you cannot handle these kind of abnormal situations. These situations will have to be addressed through this mechanism only. So to that extent, I think uh, um, uh, it's fine. But then again, I, I say that, there are inbuilt mechanism, even under the Disaster Management Act, if suppose a person is not in a position to, to pay for whatever X, Y, Z reasons, as she was pointed out that, you know, if the, if the, if the industry is in a, a bad shape, they are chartered accountants or, you know, self, uh, the, the, the professional kind of community or even that self-employed kind of, you know, uh, people, uh, they cannot pay to their people. Now, in that situation, they can very well give reasons why they cannot follow the directions issued under the Disaster Management Act. Because Section 52 is very clear. Section 51 says, Section 51 says that you need to have a reasonable cause. If you have a reasonable cause that you can't pay, you can't pay to your employees and workers. You need to demonstrate that. You can certainly, you can approach the government and seek, seek that uh, um, uh, clarity or so, uh, those directions. So Section 51 uh, gives you those powers. To, if you want to, if you if you can demonstrate the reasonable cause, I th I think uh, um, uh, there is no binding, and you, of course you need to, to seek directions from the government. So this is what my take um, on the whole issue would be. Thank you, Dr. Gemaud. I think um, um, you've been very clear on uh, specifically addressing this issue. You believe that there is no conflict. That's yes. your point one. Um, in so yes. far as the Disaster Management Act is concerned, deals with the specific situation. Of, the, of a situation which you're not encountered at all. Um, yeah. And therefore, the powers are all encompassing, definitely allows you to take these kind of measures and not in conflict. And therefore, there yes. is no question and there is no suspension also, you mentioned, of the Industrial Disputes Act. Um, yes. 
and you said even assuming there is some conflict because of section 72 there is going to be an overriding effect and uh, you can take it forward but you also touched upon a very interesting point which is on impossibility uh, mm -hmm. i think you said if there is provisions under the uh, disaster management act where if you can demonstrate to the government that there is actually a uh, reasonable cause for you not to comply with the direction like a direction such as the direction at 29th of march if companies are really not in a position to pay because of their cash flow concerns or because their companies or small organizations that depend upon daily circulation of money if that is not there you also pointed out that you can demonstrate with reasonable cause say for though under section 51 for non-compliance of the direction given under the disaster management bank there is penal prosecution in terms of either one year penal, one year imprisonment with fine or two years up to two years in the case there is an impact on life and property etc you do point out that impossibility if you can point out with reasonable cause there is probably a reason for you to not comply we're not advocating that you shouldn't comply but there is a possibility that you should demonstrate with reasonable cause Absolutely. for not complying with the order yes i will uh, yeah. just since you you rightly mentioned uh, this part that law can never mandate the people to follow impossible things or people people to do impossible things now for example take the ms you know the most impacted part in the whole process is msme sector now those msme sector out of those 7.5 crores of entities just think about it they are already under difficulty they cannot pay they can you know if, if there was some data was uh, getting suggested some data uh, some 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 reports on that that if suppose the, the for four weeks of uh, you know uh, lockdown the 25 percent of the entities would collapse for eight weeks of uh, uh, lockdown 40 percent of the entities would collapse now if suppose the data suggests that out of those 7.5 crores of entities these entities would get collapse 40 percent would collapse from where they would be paying this amount it's not possible so the law provides you that mechanism law says that you please demonstrate reasonable cause please show reasonable cause so perfect thanks i think it made a valid point dr gamaut i think uh, uh, you touched upon the msme and the travails that they're facing i think when you looked at even the the precursor for the msme act there was because of a lot of working capital issues that the msme were facing even under the previous uh, enactment the 1993 enactment of uh, payment of interest etc there were issues on working capital which the msmes did not have access to and because they did not have access to they made sure at least under the msme act in uh, 2005 through provisions 15 to 23 they've increased the interest rate compound interest rates there is a clear mandate that organizations have to make payments you have also seen more amendments in the companies act where companies have to file forms etc in the event they're not able to make payments or if there is any outstanding msmes so those issues are really valid issues that you brought out which can really and seriously impact msmes at this uh, point of time um, uh, what i'll do is i think uh, we are getting a large number of questions from the participants as well i'll want each of the speakers to probably um, tell me their views on the constitutional validity of the order i'll first go with mr kumar and then i'll come to dr gamawat uh, so it will give us at least half an hour thereafter to specifically address the questions that are being posed by the participant. We have been flooded with a large number of questions and it is only fair that we also try to answer them. So first, over to Mr. Kumar on what are the grounds you think are possible grounds for challenge of the order passed by the National Authority. Uh, thanks, Sundar. Uh, before we start, just want to add one point to the last discussion was in terms of Section 51 reasonable costs to be shown. I think it would have been more appropriate for the government who would have given a small exception to people to demonstrate if they are in financial difficulty to address the situation rather than making it a sweeping direction with no exception and wait for any employer to either fight it legally and then go through the entire vagaries of a criminal action or a civil action. I think that is something definitely maybe in the any future we have some such unforeseen circumstances, the government should look at putting an exception in the document itself. So I think that will definitely help the Section 51 argument, which was provided by Sanjeev. Now, coming to the biggest aspect, which we all believe, is whether under this uh, directions, which started with an MHA order of 29th March, followed by various notifications, directions, advisories by the state governments, uh, I have a very clear reason to believe that uh, these notifications or orders are likely to be struck down on the concept of arbitrariness, illegality, irrationality, unreasonability, as well as contrary to the various 
provisions of the constitutions. Why, when I said so, the most important thing is that this significantly impeach and enter into an unreasonable and arbitrary interference with the rights of a private employer or any, I will say, entrepreneur organization under Article 191G, which provides every citizen, I will say, a fundamental right to have his own trade occupation, which is distinct and cannot be challenged. The only restriction that has given are being given in, I will say, is in the uh, constitution under 196, which clearly hold it that it can only happen wherein that such law can be made, which is in the interest of general public, reasonable restrictions on the exercise of the right conferred, which in particular shall have the effect of any existing law. And the only two things are in terms of a professional or technical qualification or carrying off by the state or a corporation over control by the state in the same business to the exclusion, complete or partial. So I think the restriction that has been, I will say, embodied in our constitution as reasonable restriction to the fundamental right of trade and business and occupation can't be you know, taken out in such a large banner where big amount of things have been pushed down. Secondly, the other argument is going to come is the biggest one is the challenge to the bias or the constitutional validity of section two under which the disaster management act or any of the provision which has been invoked by the government to impose the financial obligation of the private sector for payment of wage, either termination, reduction of force, etc., etc. So that will have a big amount of challenge to be displayed across by the government when it defends it. Because I believe uh, uh, when you look at the biggest element of section 72, also we look at an inconsistency, a subordinate legislation without deriving powers from the main act has always been held to be not an area on which the the notification will stand the scrutiny of the court. In addition to this, there have been various judgments of the High Court and Supreme Court on the concept in labor law of equal work, equal pay, or pay, no work, no pay. And it can't differentiate, or what it said to do is that people who are in lockdown condition and who are in working condition are being demonstrated differently, or when they are differently placed in the same condition. Next would be the conflict between the Industrial Dispute Act under section 25C to 25N towards layout retrenchment versus whether the overriding powers can be taken to do that. Beyond that, I think one more fundamental thing that comes into effect is the overall thing is that can government enter this domain and try to direct parties not to terminate or terminate when they can be also in the realm of contract of employment between employer and employee may not be the workman category. So that's one more fundamental argument that's going to be tested. And lastly, the most important aspect which I will see is that by directing various employees in the private sector to keep on paying the salaries till this economic downturn caused by the pandemic and the opening thereafter, it's not going to be a short term, it's a long term. So if you're not provided a horizon till when this will imply, you are seeing that you are pushing a otherwise very financially well of company to go slowly into a flow where it would not be there to survive on its own, which may lead it to an insolvency and it to earth expose the promoters to, to I think, be uh, able to, they would have given a lot of their private, uh, I will say, sureties over where places. I think that will get impacted as of the family members. And if you look at it, Article 300A clearly provides a constitution that no property of an individual can be taken out by the government without a due course of law. So I think if you look at, I am not going too much into detail because definitely a lot of arguments would be cast in the court about these issues. Definitely, I believe that the way uh, these uh, concepts have not been touched or understood, uh, I will definitely believe that the courts would have to look at this at a larger level and maybe give directions to the government to rethink in a manner it should provide attention in case of a similar nature happens, maybe in a geography like in the case of a cyclone, in case of floods, etc., how to act it. I think definitely time has come to look that. But overall, the legal challenge and the constitutional framework will be a very good, uh, interesting proposition for a lot of us in legal fraternity to watch for. And I definitely believe that we have a very good case if I am the petitioner in this matter. Thanks. 
thank you, Mr. Kumar. I think uh, you've put forward a number of grounds for challenge. Um, I'll just quickly supplement a few of those. One is, of course, you mentioned 14, arbitrariness. I think you had also previously touched upon the fact about um, unequals being treated equally. You can't paint everyone with the same brush. So, for companies that are not cash rich, can you make a mandate and direct them to pay wages? Then you spoke about reasonable restrictions in terms of 191G and also touched upon proportionality. We were also aware about the recent cryptocurrency judgment uh, of Justice Amish wherein they clearly pointed out that when you're looking at proportionality, you also need to see if there is any least restrictive measure, that is, there any less invasive measure that is possible. I, I think previously also you had mentioned about other steps taken by other governments um, to help employers and workers. It also touched about the fact that money can be channelized from the consolidated fund. So therefore, the question is whether this is the most uh, least restrictive option is also an issue that can be challenged. You touched about Section 25C and the issues on overriding effect, whether layoff will apply in this case. Uh, you also touched about the fact about Article 300A, um, about uh, appropriation of property in such a circumstance, and uh, whether government can even enter into such a domain between employers and employees. What is the uh, right of governments in such a circumstance in light of the powers under the Disaster Management Act to enforce such a kind of stipulation or restriction? And then more importantly, I think you mentioned about the fact about if there is no horizon to this entire direction, if the lockdown were to continue for some more time, it will bring various industries to the brink. So what will happen to them? So I think various points. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar. I'll quickly give an op opportunity to Dr. Gemawath uh, to also maybe share a few of his views. I'll request Dr. Gemawath uh, if you can maybe uh, summarize in four or five minutes max so that we can then take up questions from the audience. Uh, there are hardly a large number of questions and uh, we would like to address as many questions as possible. So over to you. Yeah, yeah. so I, my quick comment would be Sundar. And uh, since the doctrine of proportionality or principle of proportionality was, uh, you know, argued by Schlewell and I think you also, I think just to counter that, I would say that when there is a principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality is not irrelevant. Let's talk about the principle of necessity. The principle of necessity at that point of time was to come out with the circular. As I said earlier, that we can certainly deliberate in terms of the quality of orders, etc. Of course, perhaps, and I'm sure, perhaps uh, in the times to come, government would come out with some other mechanism of this because these are the temporary solutions. These temporary solutions cannot become a permanent solution, so to say. So I agree with this, whether that the BOCW fund or the, 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 the national fund, there are certain steps which are required to be done by the government and perhaps gradually government would be doing this. But then from a principle of necessity standpoint, whatever directions were issued at that point of time, they were perhaps relevant. So this is what my counter uh, as far as uh, this view is concerned. I would also like to point out here one thing and which is very important to my understanding. Uh, and there I would like to sum up uh, the whole mechanism. The Disaster Management Act is a social welfare legislation in a way. Uh, a way. Now, these kind of legislations, perhaps they might not bring the results in terms of the actual enforcement because people would try to enforce this, but then actual enforcement when you are dealing with, a, with crores of people, even take example of the migrant labor there are four crores migrant labor that's a you know more than the population of some of the countries now in a situation like this what is relevant is that government comes out with the legislative framework or directions etc or guidelines and which will give a pub give, uh, give public to, to to frame opinion to give a push to the public to in terms of framing opinion and also to follow this uh, so, so this is what the largely the objective of uh, these kind of directions would be. Perhaps actual conviction might not happen, but then this would give a public opinion to take a certain shape. And, and it reminds me, it reminds me a quote from Pandit Nehru. When the Dori Prohibition Act was laid before the parliament, what Pandit Nehru said is that these social deep-rooted problems perhaps cannot be solved through a legislative mechanism like this. But then these legislations are required and these are essentials because they frame a public opinion to take a certain shape. Today, for example, as Srival is arguing, the public opinion is getting framed that yes, government should, should essentially and as early as possible work towards creating a national fund because these situations might come up in the times to come. 
this also give a public uh, you know a, a, a public opinion gets framed that yes there is a difficult situation abnormal time and employers to the extent possible they should be supporting their uh, uh, workers but then i i i i am uh, conscious about this fact that these kind of measures cannot continue indefinitely they have a time horizon because these are these measures are taken in abnormal situations abnormal circumstances they can only be a temporary solutions and uh, uh, gradually perhaps uh, uh, the the things would uh, uh, would be would be better off of course i am conscious about this fact also that most of the organizations in the msme sector perhaps would collapse if this continues now in a situation like this perhaps enforcement of this kind of uh, uh, you know direction perhaps might not be possible so with this i just want to uh, close on this thank you uh, thank you dr gemoth i think you spoke on uh, quite a few points including on the principle of necessity and these were really uh, uh, situations akin to emergency and uh, at that point of time on 29th march measure had to be taken to ensure that the migrant workers are stopped so therefore it was a necessary measure and proportionality cannot be considered because there has to be some amount of leeway that has to be given it's a policy decision at the end of the day some leeway has to be given to the governments in such kind of circumstances so that they can evaluate and take steps temporary measures we also see a lot of relaxations otherwise taking place in the lockdown orders slowly establishments are being allowed to operate so possibly that's a principle of necessity and he also said the quality of orders could have been more desirable but it is necessary at that point of time and he also said this is more a temporary measure and we do hope over a period of time things will probably improve okay yes. uh, thank you uh, thank you dr gemoth i will uh, i think now open up the questions i think we have received a large number of questions i will uh, first pose a question to mr kumar on uh, uh, the issue of uh, 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 employees above managerial staff i think we've got some questions because we've already seen the scope of the 29th march order deals with workers who are probably below the level of managerial staff uh, the question is what will be the uh, uh, steps that industry can take in so far as other laborers are concerned assuming that there is a force major clause that is there in the contract is there a possibility uh, can you terminate can you not terminate in these kind of circumstances what do you think should be the right step that the industry should do so before you start i think i want to say that the categorization of employees are also in various buckets so we have the typical workman who is the blue collared worker coming under the ida act or payment of wage act they could be the employees who are the white collared employees who are skilled players who are in the managerial or supervisory grade then you will have consultants working with the corporates then you have fixed term employees and lastly you will have service providers who are housing people at which got the employment contracts so usually a, a big term corporate would say instead of employing say 40 50 people they will give it to another entity and say do that so the force major clause option would definitely come when you look at such acts not of interse contract between an employer and employee so if there is a clause as i am working as a general manager in a company and i have a contract of employment i definitely we don't see a force major clause embodied usually in the employment agreement the only such force major clause will come when a corporate has a service provider agreement with a mofoi etc ranch and many of the organizations who are providing manpower in such clauses if there is a provision of force major there is a provision of kicking in there is a notification done and thereafter there is an opportunity of not performing his obligation specifically in terms of payment of i will say revenue or salaries to those or cost definitely there is a chance and i believe this will put both the service provider company and its employees under a lot of pain with respect to the normal employees in any company who are in a managerial grade or in a supervisory grade i believe they are not touched by the protection of the in, in uh, industrial disputes act definitely they will be at a contract of employment their contract with employment have certain clause of one month two month three month six month severance pay notice from either side or it would be a salary in lieu thereof uh, whether it's a basic salary or a complete salary also depends on the facts of the document of each customer uh, of each person i think that is one would look definitely in such testing times i expect uh, the employers to show some sort of a maturity in terms of how they handle also we as general counsels in various corporate part of the executive committees also need to voice our concerns on looking at how we can address this difficult situation by taking salary cuts at the pyramid at different levels so that we balance the entire requirement of 
the larger kitty available to people to at least pay a survival salary so i will definitely believe an example best would be in a corporate with four bands i think the top band takes an x cut the next level takes a bit more lower and as we come the biggest base at the bottom at least gets a decent amount of salary even at reduced level so over the next 6 to 8 months they can survive rather than by taking a drastic step of you know sacking or laying off 25% workforce a reduction in salary spread across to match the salary of reduced salary would be the best option so for managerial mm-hmm. staff i think you are not protected as much in my view because the employers are anyway challenged it people who have so far not challenges these uh, orders can always challenge when a prosecution is started under the uh, Nash disaster management act with the local authorities you can go to the high court and defend so i believe best option is to have a win win situation worked out thank you thank you mr kumar i think you've uh, pointed out that at least for managerial staff there is a possibility to take uh, a pay cut the overall uh, Uh, some substance uh, there is a related question i'll probably post that to dr gamawat um, the question is whether you may deduct the salary of employee after taking the consent to such deduction by the employer and whether labor law prevent employer from deducting the salary of employees this is something similar i just want to add a little bit more uh, to this particular question one of course taking consent but we also have certain states we should be mindful about like states like andhra pradesh and telangana uh, wherein they have continued the orders that have been passed in the epidemic diseases act subsequently so those orders also relate not just to workers but also to employees wherein there is a clear direction that payment has to be made for employees also certain case like tamil nadu we believe that there is a super notification that's been passed wherein initially they said make payment of wages to all uh, employees also but subsequently they superseded the notification so we'll have to look at from each state's perspective that's a point but at least if we can have your views on uh, whether we should take the con- can we take the consent of employees Uh, and whether if there is any state notification um, in a particular state can the consent prevail or will the state notification prevail if you can share your point of view on that as well well uh, sundar i would say two things one is as regards the uh, employer employee relationship is concerned and employer i am talking about the employee who is not covered under the category of worker then you can always that would always be governed with the employment contract Now, if the the employ if that gets governed under the employment contract, then employment contract can always be amended or modified with consent. So consent is the best mechanism in terms of if you want to renegotiate or if you want to take some measures, um, uh, you know, with the with the with the consent of the employee. So that is the best mechanism. Now coming to the issue of the workers. Now in the case of workers as well. i would suggest that if suppose we are entering into an arrangement with the union trade unions and all all the workers and uh, 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 if that mechanism works in terms of seeking their consent and there is no uh, no issue there is no coercion so to say there is no pressure from the employer side in terms of them agreeing to all this and if the, all these things happen under the under the you know guidance and presence of the labor authorities i think it's a workable solution and this 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 can be achieved uh so this is what i would be uh, briefly saying now as regards various states passing certain directions of that nature whereby they are including even the managerial category of employees etc i think they are subject to and uh, and i would be um, uh, agreeing with stevels on this they are they are subject to challenge um, on the on the you know uh, and they are the doctrine of proportionality perhaps would trigger in um uh, because th- those are you know uh, those directions have been issued without application of mine in fact you know think about a situation a person who is drawing a a, a salary between 1 crore to 5 crore of rupees and if you, you if you are giving direction that that amount should be paid i think it's a, it's a, it's ridiculous it's a, it's a mockery of the whole process of directions which gets issued under the epidemic diseases act or the disaster management act i don't think that that should be the intent of the um, uh, you know state Uh, so i think both those kind of directions would definitely get cha- uh, challenged as for the courts are concerned uh, but then uh, uh, yes uh, in the back of your mind this issue would always be there that you need to be treating workers differently as compared to your normal managerial people thanks thank you thank you uh, dr kemal i think uh, very lucid and clearly pointed out what is the legal position uh the next question that we have is uh, slightly different it is on uh, 
because as of now we've been dealing with industries that have been closed down as a result of the lockdown uh, one of the questions that's been asked is um, there are certain companies and organizations that are providing essential services so all of us are able to carry on our day to day activities now for those particular organizations um, do these restrictions still apply or uh, do they deal with uh, can they terminate or suspend the employees or can they take any other restrictions against their employees so that's the question for uh, mr kumar uh thanks sudha i think uh, this is a very very important question to address at this times because i must thank all those people or staff who are providing support to us in this challenging times be it the medical staff or the essential supplies and also the delivery people i must say that they are doing a very herculean task to support us in this times uh i will say that people who are in the essential services have been exempted to operate in this time and there has been a clarification by an mha and by local authorities very clearly that if any industry or any establishment is allowed to operate and their workers don't turn up you are well within a rights not to pay them for the period in which they are supposed to turn before the uh, for the work so number one is they are not entitled to pay provided they can show some ex exemptions in sense that if their homes are in some containment zones or there is some restriction put by the local administration or the law enforcement agency not able to go out or in case of any such personal emergencies at home i think there will be an exception otherwise then and if they are not coming i think with the few warnings both over calls texts emails etc the employers are full within the right to take the next steps of engaging in that lines thank you thank you mr kumar i think uh, clearly pointed out what is the law at this point of time so hopefully uh, our friends who are in the engaged in providing essential services will benefit from your uh, answer uh, the next question i have is uh, uh, something that arises from yesterday uh, all of us are aware that the supreme court has seized of a petition uh, filed by certain msme associations and certain organizations who are msmes um, and the government had uh, uh agreed before the supreme court to provide a status report on the policy basis for issuing the 29th march order so the question that we have from one of the participants is um, is it advisable to strictly comply with the order till the government files it affidavit or can employer stop paying for now uh, so what is the present status uh, there is no stay granted etc so in light of this uh, what should the employers do for the next two weeks mr Ge dr gemoth you can answer this question please well uh, uh, sundar the way in which the the uh, order exists today that has not been modified amended in any manner whatsoever these are the directions issued under the disaster management act non compliance would lead to prosecution and so from that perspective definitely this needs to be complied with there is no second thought about it and let me tell you the uh, the, the liability under this law is indeed harsh so so this needs to be complied with sundar i just to add one more point to that yes sir please go ahead please okay so my view would be that uh, in view of the challenging times of maybe a one or two month period i would request employers to definitely uh, pay the salaries of to their existing staff for a period of say for the month of march april definitely yes thereafter i think they should take a step of writing to the local administration or the industry association about the financial uh, difficulties they are facing in terms of their financial condition and say it is not sustainable for them to do so and i'm thinking about those majority of the last people in the lower pyramid who can comply with these things like the small and micro medium and msc things they should definitely make representations so that if god forbid coming to the third month the lockdown is not opened or still there are directions that the supreme court doesn't give any interim relief even if they don't pay they have an opportunity of a defense when the actual matter comes they can say that we had created or a flag the issue of a financial incapability because as you know the market is so bad you won't even get finance or at any rate from the uh, institutions to provide you to make the payment of salaries so i think it makes sense for a lot of these employees to definitely employers to at least flag up the issue at various levels so that at least they can use that as a defense that's one point i would like to add i will just add on this sundar i completely agree with steve's views on this i will 
completely agree with Shival's views on this. Uh, definitely, if suppose there's no change in the directions in the times to come, then all those entities through association or otherwise, they should represent to the government that instead of paying X amount, they should be allowed to pay Y amount. That Y amount can be minimum wages. For example, at least I would be expecting that this should be linked with the minimum wages. You cannot have a, a situation whereby the people's wages and salaries are too high than the minimum wages. So you will be, the, the organization themselves, they would get, um, go bankrupt. So I think those representations should be made uh, on case to case basis also they need to demonstrate that they have um, uh, you know the financial difficulty in terms of paying this that demonstration is very very essential you cannot uh, uh, keep on spending money uh, uh, left right center and say that no you will not be paying wages so so that needs to be demonstrated thanks um, i think you pointed out uh, quite a few both of you identified key issues one of course there is no stay and significant implications will arise if you stop making payment of wages so therefore that is mandatory at this point of time but I think uh, two other key points have come. One is uh, we do not know when this lockdown is going to get over. So we should probably make representations at a near future point in time. That's a key point and maybe link it up with minimum wages so that uh, we are trying to cooperate in this difficult times with the government to make sure that we are able to support their efforts. But at the same time, trying to salvage the uh, industry as well. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So uh, my next question is. Uh, uh, a general one um, i'll uh, i think i'll pose it to mr kumar uh, the question is on whether this notification applies only to those registered under the shops and establishment act or does it apply to all employers because the words used in the 29 march order says all employers be it in uh, shop in industry or shops and commercial establishment shall have to make uh, payment of wages to their workers so is it only for registered those under registered under the shops and establishment act or for everyone or other every employees like a sole proprietor or a partnership firm there could be a lot of entries outside industry shops and establishment will they also be covered within that so thanks sundar i think uh, when one looks at the various orders passed whether with the mha and followed by various labor authorities across the state i think there has been an interchange use of words from wages salaries private employers shop and establishments i think it's it has been spread in a manner that it has caused considerable confusion and cast an belief across all the people that it applies to every single person who is employed under someone. So I believe the interpretation that has gone so far would by whether in initially it started with for migrant workers, but slowly and steadily, I think it has been relaxed over every pattern change from various authorities to expand the definition for all employees. And I think there's a reasonable expectation, as I said, for every employee for think. And I will take that extension further. It is be my driver or my mate, even though they're not coming and serving me. I think I have a responsibility to handle them, if not for a long period, definitely for the next three months, definitely. And thereafter, we may look at whether I'm getting a driver who's not paying. Should I pay him the 100% or I should have 50% of that to look that he can meet his ends? So I think that's one of the things that will definitely happen. But in immediate times, I think everybody's covered. There will be an extension of hand. But over the period of time, with courts clarification, maybe there will be a, a at the political establishment level, there will be some representations made from industry association. Things will be recast, and I think in another 15 days' time, there will be some more clarity by which we will expect that uh, what would apply to whom would come very clearly. As we saw also in the lockdown guidelines, it got clarified from time to time how in various stages. I think the same approach will happen here also. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, I think there are a lot of questions pouring in. I'm just trying to see which would be most appropriate. Just give me um, another issue is under uh, uh, probably under contract labor uh, act because you have a large number of industry and establishments uh, which engage contract labor. So I think one of the questions that we have is uh, are the employers liable to pay to the contractors in order for the contractors to pay the salary to their employees is that a mandate at this point of time because normally the principal obligation is upon the contractor um, so what happens in a case where the contractor is unable to pay or is there an obligation at this point of time upon the principal employer to pay uh, the contractor this question i pose to dr gema gema thanks sundar i think um, my view is that ultimately in all contract labor the ultimate responsibility would always be with the principal employer so if the contractor doesn't pay principal employer will have to pay 
there is no second thought about it that liability is already there under the contract labor regulation act so so you cannot uh, uh, take a position that contractor has not paid and so you are not liable in fact the the, the liability would rest with principal employer only just to add a point over there usually in various big corporates you have a contract with such uh, contracting parties who are there is a principal employer and form an organization and there is another entity which is the contract labor uh, employing one so i believe that the contract there will be clear cut mechanism paid out whereas it will clearly stipulate that in case of happening of abc the contract can be terminated or suspended i think one needs to really look at those clauses also because uh, it can't be an unending requirement on an employer to pay the salary of his contract employees even if the contract within which he has engaged them has been terminated so one has to look at that whether they are reasonable provisions and usually what happens is force major and termination are the last clauses which the business teams look at at the time of closing a transaction and is usually left to the hr team or the legal teams to look at it and say along with the help of an external consultant or lawyer that whether we should look and debate it and usually you lay with a vanilla clause not looking at your special circumstances of your industries and your working or where you are operating so i think these factors going forward definitely have a bit role to play but usually i will believe for uh, various people who have a special contract in place one should look at it whether there is a provision for termination terminate pay the dues till that time with 30 60 or 90 days and thereafter i think your obligation will come to an end unlike your direct employees etc which are directly related to be paid by by the or uh, under these orders so far thanks Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Kumar. I think I'll again come back to you for the next question. Is there a lot of questions otherwise that have been posed on uh, the challenge to the um, order of 29th of March, and um, uh, uh, they want probably a little bit more input or input on the test of reasonableness that may be applicable. And there are certain questions that have been posed on uh, uh, what is the likelihood uh, we believe the panelists believe that the judiciary may strike down the order. This I leave it to both of you. Uh, uh first question you can answer and then both of you can answer the second question thank you so first first question the first question which i see is that uh, the test of reasonableness i uh, reasonableness is in my view is quite uh, high i believe that the court should have very good grounds to strike it down i have said so in various provisions of the article of the constitution their interplay with the industrial disputes act whether they can enter the domain of private persons under the article 191g whether it's the reasonability in terms of treating all differently placed organizations in one platter i think there are various various things to do and i think we may require one webinar specially to deal this over a two year two month or two hour period uh, having said that i certainly believe that uh, there are very good chances this may happen but it may happen with a stretch of time i don't think that the uh, supreme court would spend the hearings over the next x number of months and come with an order immediately it will take a time so i'd leave it to the judicial or uh, commercial sense of the employers today to take a call whether they would like to comply with it in the interim and thereafter look at uh, whether to look at uh, how to recover this because i think once you have paid salaries to your employees you can't recover it it's not so easy so definitely it's it's a very hobson's choice whether to comply or not to comply i leave it to the Uh, judgment of individual employers as advised by their legal counsels and their internal finance heads who provide the finance to them on how to address the situation i think it won't be very fair on my part to say well, you should take option a or option b but there are good chances this this particular order can get quashed at the supreme court level secondly assuming in the interim they don't comply and they get a specific notice under this disaster management act then they have a remedy of moving to the high court and writ jurisdiction and challenging that notice because for the various reasons i said or it's already been argued in the supreme court they have a right to file their own case to protect or defend themselves uh dr gemaut do you have a similar view or, or uh... no i have a differing view on this uh i would agree with shivals only in that situation that if suppose this particular direction and order become permanent in nature then perhaps what shival is arguing is right but then so far as this is a temporary measure and that this remains temporary measure 
then in that situation, I don't think that the doctrine of, you know, the, the principle of proportionality, etc., would come into play. And in fact, this would be a, a more a principle of necessity, number one. Number two, a, a very, you know, one argument which can you can always make here in support of these directions is that whether business organizations are not running risk, are they not taking risk? There are always business risks when you don't have 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 orders in place but then while you 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 keep on paying to your employees there are situations of this nature in all organizations life so there are so in a situation like this there are business risks also which business organizations take now this is this is a national level issue and that needs to be tackled and addressed accordingly so to my understanding if we go by article 142 it would be in the interest of justice those directions were right and they are right but then if they become permanent in nature then there are issues then you can very well say article 265 and article 300a otherwise no thanks thank you mr kevin i think we also have a question on one of the participants is a lawyer mr venkat ramana uh, so i'll pose this question to mr kumar uh, his question is on whether article 21 will it not save the notification considering the right to livelihood of migrant workers and also there is a separate act protecting migrant laborers in light of that, are these notifications not going to be saved by the courts? Uh, very well articulated. But the fundamental difference I have to make on this point is that the responsibility under Article 21 rise with the state and it can't be passed on to the individual private employers without there being any action thought or looked at by the state at the state level or at the central level. If you look at it, I think there is section 13 of this act which provides for special remedies for anybody who has some loan liabilities. One would say that the government didn't invoke the section 13 of the DMA Act when it asked the, uh, what I call the uh, RBI to recommend to the banks to come with a moratorium of three months because section 13 gives relief for payment of rules, etc., affected by disaster very clearly under this act, but that was not invoked. So what was the necessity at this juncture for the government to have invoked uh, a measure of payment of wages and salary by the private guys on this fund. So definitely a recommended nature saying that please try to do that. We expect you to pay for next three months or give it 50%. Something of that nature would have definitely, because if you look at it, majority of people today are at homes. They're not traveling. So if you look at the cost of survival is always lesser than the salary. So they could not have been such thing saying that you can't reduce wage, you can't terminate. I think that was an overreach. So definitely Article 21 is there to, I will say, protect the interest of any uh, uh, citizen of this country. And definitely it comes to his help, but at not at the cost of the private uh, person's exchequer. It has to be the public exchequer. And there are various modes in which it could have been collected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. I think you've given a, a good overview on how probably the challenge under 21 will not probably uh, uh, be uh, upholding the notification because it's principally an obligation vis-a-vis -vis the state uh, which is under article 12 and uh, which is a NDM authority in the instant case uh, i think we are quickly moving to the last segment of our uh, webinar i'll probably try to take one or two more questions that i see on the panel uh, i'll post this to uh, dr gemawat uh, this is um, slightly legal it's also slightly practical in terms of whether a deferral of salary can be allowed at this point of time for employees is that something that can be done and uh, of course different states have given an obligation to specifically mandate payment like telangana andhra we've seen etc but otherwise can the salaries be deferred the entire salary we spoke about redu reducing the salary but can salaries be completely deferred at this point of time well Over i would to, say okay. that yeah i would say that with consent as we discussed earlier that with consent if you want to change the the the, the structure of compensation and the timing of compensation that can always be done and as far as the employer employee relationship is concerned that is very much possible because you you govern uh, through those uh, you know the individual contracts uh, and you can always make those changes but then as far as workers are concerned uh, at times practically difficult but then not impossible and you can always have that consensus uh, uh, kind of process whereby those uh, you know compensation can be uh, deferred that's it thank you Thank you, Dr. Gemal. I think we have more or less come to the, um, uh, the close of our webinar. What I'll do is I'll probably give uh, one minute each to both the panelists so they can sum up 
and indicate what they think are going to be the key issues and what could be done. Maybe a little more than a minute, a minute and a half, and then maybe we can close the webinar thereafter. Thank you. Dr. Gemath, you can start. <laughs> okay. Well, I would say that, you know, the uh, roads ahead are uh, difficult and uh, roads ahead are difficult in terms of uh, the three major issues and all three issues are, you know, it's a complete vicious cycle today. Uh, I'm not trying to be sounding pessimistic here, uh, only raising these issues so that we can take some effective measures or the government can take some effective measures and not only government, even the, the, the all organizations, whether that be public sector, or private sector and all organizations. And the difficulty here is uh, as man, money and uh, 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 man, money, basically, uh, you know, there's a major problem in terms of um, uh, the workforce, workforce, migrant uh, laborers or workers. They have, you know, gone to, to, to their respective places. Bringing them is a major challenge right now. Money is a major problem for the simple reason that for the th this decade, we have seen the, the, the lowest kind of GDP growth. Uh, even otherwise, before COVID also, our situation was very, very poor in terms of the GDP growth, uh, in terms of unemployment and in terms of slowdown in the overall economy. Now, in this backdrop, I think uh, the major issue would be uh, the, the, the money as well. Uh, uh, man and money, both these factors would be playing a major role and it's a vicious cycle. How we would be overcoming this, uh, that would be a challenge in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kemal. And I so, would also like to mention one more thing. I think, you know, I, I miss that. Sorry, Stevens. Because of this man and machine, the third issue which is getting impacted is also material. The whole supply chain has got disrupted completely. And supply chain has got disrupted not only from a domestic market, even from a global market. And I think that all these three factors would be leading to a further slowdown in the uh, industry uh, unless the appropriate and effective measures are taken. Thanks. Yeah, Shivan. Okay. So my last words on this subject would be that we are at very challenging times. We have to look at three horizons from now. First is when the lockdown will be lifted. Second after when the entire nation would be able to, especially in the areas like Delhi and Bombay, which are seriously affected, how would they be able to cope and come out of COVID exposure? And the third would be when economy will come back to normalcy. I think we have three different horizons. We have to apply our thresholds and reasoning differently on all these aspects. Secondly, uh, I think there is a time for co-optation between competitors. We have to look at not competing and looking at how we can survive in the market together. Uh, in terms of your relationship, I think every employer, employee must look at what I have a back balance rather than cutting 40% of my workers. Can I just reduce wages across and ensure that every kitchen of every employee remains earning till the time we get back to a decent economy. Uh, last and not the least, I would say that this is the times at which we all need to come back and support the government and seeing how we can look at it for the next round, not today, and see whether we can build up a framework where we can help each other in the times to come. So all of our social welfare legislations so far were tested today, and I don't think they've been able to sustain and give support to the needy people when it came today. So you are falling back on requirements of mandating payment, etc. Whereas in important jurisdiction of outside, like in abroad, I think the government and the fiscal mechanism comes into play to support the unemployment. I think times have come, even though we are at a very high amount of uh, population and uh, unemployment is very high, but I think we have to evolve something over the period of time. It can't happen overnight, but there has to be a thought towards that. Lastly, uh, the issue on how to address the current situations more should require, I believe, uh, uh, I will say mature handling rather than legal. I should prefer people sitting across the table discussing the issues with their employers, unions, rather than going to the courts because you can't burden the courts with all the legal issues and find answers mm -hmm. what needs to be found between the domains of employer and employee. So that are my final words. And I think we all together will be able to come out of this uh, times together. And we look forward to another session where we'll be looking at really some another interesting aspect. Thank you. And thank you, Sundar, and thank you, Economic Times, and thank you, Shrival. It was a great session. Thank you, Dr. Gemma. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. It was a real pleasure, a privilege of moderating uh, two stalwarts in the legal profession. So, um,
my only thoughts are i think let's all stay positive i'm sure all of us will come out of this i thank you once again for your uh, thought provoking discussion and inspiring words on practical thoughts thank you very much i also do hope the uh, other participants have enjoyed and uh, taken a lot of points from the discussion today thank you very much over to surbi yes so i would like thank to you. thank all of our speaker for sharing these insights and providing such a better perspective on the subject so i will say that it was really a wonderful illuminating enlightening and informative session it was really nice to listen to all of you and i'm so sure that today our audience must have got some really good benefit out of it and i would like to thank our participants and attendees for listening to us very very patiently and carefully we'll be keep coming with such interesting and informative virtual activities stay tuned to etlegalworld.com stay safe thank you so much thank you everyone thank you very much thank you thank you thank you everyone good day